welcome to Pakistani Profile. My guest for today is a great inspiration not only for me but everyone who knows him. He is a life coach, a motivational speaker and a writer whose aim is to basically highlight the human potential. He surely does help others realize the positive significance that limitations have in our lives. Yes, I have with me no nobody else but Sarmad Tariq. Hello, Sarman. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? Good to be here. Welcome to our show. It's Thank an honor you. to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, Sarman, we will talk about your current life, but let's go back to your past. How has your childhood been, um, your education, what environment were you brought up in? Um, my abba was uh, in the army, so we moved a lot. Okay. Uh, never stuck to a school for too long. And uh, which was good in a way because, uh, you know, you get to see other places and meet other people. Unfortunately, I had that time or that luxury only till the age of 15. Mm. And that is when um, I dived into shallow water and broke my neck. But childhood-wise, I had a very stable, you know, family. And uh, I think Sari Umar, the schools or colleges, that I went to were all government schools and we were the ones who were wearing, you know, Malte Ranka Shalwar Kameez and going there. And But at that time, I would say that, you know, teachers were better or maybe I don't see that anymore in government schools especially. Mm -hmm. So it was a very uh, humble life and very fun life. And I did most of the things that I wanted to do then. I was into sports. I wanted to swim and uh, do boxing and represent Pakistan or, you know, in a platform where I could become the world heavyweight champion of the world, etc. Right. So I had the plan laid out for me in my head, but uh, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, after my metric exam, I went to Kuchanwala with my cousins and I was staying with them and one day we came across a canal which was muddy, murky water. And I asked somebody where is the deep end and he just pointed out and I didn't realize that he was speaking in, in the terms of relevance mm -hmm. because the point that I was standing was around six inches deep and where he pointed was only two and a half inches deep. So relatively it was deeper over there but when I dived head on it wasn't deep enough for a six foot four inch and uh, you know more than a hundred kg of body weight. Uh, so I dived, I hit my head, broke my neck from three places. Um, you know, my cousins thought that I'm, you know, just, uh, what do you call it? I was a good swimmer. So they thought that, you know, I'm playing and I'm, you know, making fun of things, etc. So they did play a little bit of basketball with my head, but then I told them that I think I've broken my arms. Because that's the only thing that I could think of at that time. Mm. So they turned me around, then they took me out, then, you know, I was put in a charpai, then at the back of a truck, and from that village we were taken to the hospital in Gujranwala, then to Lahore the same night where they drilled two holes in my skull and tied around 30 kgs of weight. I could not eat on my own. I had pipes throughout. I required three people to turn me from one angle to the other. Um, and, you know, uh, a lot of complications. One that, you know, I had, like, in my skull, I had, you know, a clamp which was pulling me constantly with 30 kgs of weight. So anyway, not to get into the details of it, it was initially very tough, but uh, somehow at that age, I thought that I'll get out of it. And, you know, it's just a very good excuse to having bad marks in metric. And my result was about to come out. And I thought, if I failed in one hour, I won't say anything. And I started demanding that, you know, I need a motorbike when I go to college or etc. Et you know, whatever a child would do. So I was naive enough to look at it, look at the whole situation in a very positive way yeah. somehow. Exploiting it, but in a positive way. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, it was all good. Uh, obviously, my parents knew the whole deal. And uh, for them and for my sister, it was... Sisters, it was not uh, very helpful, I would say. Uh, it took me around three years in bed and lots of infections and lots of medical complications because of mm -hmm. lack of facilities in Pakistan. Then my parents sold off everything and took me to England. Mm -hmm. I could not afford the full rehab, but I was able to sit on a wheelchair, wear normal clothes and come back in three months. So I came back, everybody said that why don't you stay back in England, there are better services, health, 
education, social, uh, you know, in every way it is mm -hmm. better. So to have a future, you must stay back. And it wasn't the fact that I was too patriotic to stick around in Pakistan mm -hmm. and not leave Pakistan. The main um, thing that I had in my mind was that I've lost 50% of myself, right. which was my physical being. And at that age, I was very proud and cocky about it. Right. But uh, I did not want to lose out on the other 50% of myself, which was my family, my friends, and places where I grew up, and, you know, enjoying life the way I did. Right. So I came back, I came back with a few standards that I'm not going to, you know, use my disability as an excuse and not right. get into quota system or Ustranki Chitome. So I applied to different colleges. It was... Um, not easy to get in. Six of them initially rejected me uh, because at that time computers were not very popular and my fingers don't work so I cannot write with my hand. Right. So um, finally I got in as a casual student. Uh, I did my FA as a uh, you know private candidate to recover a few one year of my uh, education which was missed due to my accident. Uh, based on that result, I got in B.A. as a regular student in uh, Sir College, Rahul Pindi. And uh, all, as soon as I did my graduation, I went out and I thought that, you know, uh, to get into corporate sector, I need to wear a suit and tie, make myself financially independent because now I'm physically dependent, so I have to make enough money that, you know, I can maintain myself and maintain my expenses also because being in my condition is not very cheap to and survive. So I'll put you on hold here. Uh, you yeah. just mentioned that the education and uh, you got rejected from six different institutes. So um, that is a big constraint, right, for all the, not just you, all the other handicapped people. Yeah. That. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Because, you know, you have been through a very tough time and much you have taken it very positively and you have succeeded out of it, right? Yeah, so, um, what, like, do you think any initiatives should be taken at that point? I think a lot of people are already working on it. Yeah. And uh, things have changed because I'm speaking of 94, 95. Right. And that was when, you know, I think we were called uh, crippled. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we are called physically challenged or rather person with disabilities, right. PWDs. So uh, the terms have changed and I believe that, you know, somehow the attitude of uh, institutions has also changed. Uh, privatization of institutes has also helped a lot because, you know, people are slightly more um, expensive, but at the same time more aware of issues uh, related so to this. as compared to your time, there is more awareness at this point. At this point, definitely. I, being done. I see a lot of students going to, you know, good universities and working in good organizations. Right. So I feel there's a lot of... So difference. eventually you did complete your master's? In, uh, yes, I did my MBA uh, only because of the reason everybody was doing it. Uh, at that time, I did not think about it, why I want to get into it. But I, one thing that I was clear about that I want to wear a suit and tie and be a corporate executive and make a lot of money so that, you know, I can do whatever I want to do in Pakistan in my condition. Right. So I did that and finally succeeded in it. And in the way, I met a wonderful lady, Zara, and we got married. Right. And uh, once I was living, then I started living independently in my own apartment. And um, it was more or less a life that I never expected for myself and a lot of other people never expected it out of me. And uh, as soon as the challenges went down, uh, I had to come up with my, you know, the old ones that I had and bring them out of the closet. And I started pursuing, you know, one fine day, just left my job and pursue my athletic course. Mm -hmm. And I did that uh, by doing a non-stop drive from Khaibar to Karachi. Yeah, that was the world record that you had set. Uh, it's a world record because nobody else in my condition is crazy enough to do it or stupid enough to do it. And uh, I drove... I a, won't call it stupid. I think that was your passion. And uh, it was my passion. Coming from an athletic background, you always... You didn't want it to give up. In my, uh, yeah, condition. like, you know, uh, when I repeat the fact that in my condition, what I mean to say is that I'm shoulder down paralyzed. 
I don't breathe through my lungs, I breathe through my diaphragm. A normal person takes in around 750 cc of oxygen. I take in around only 150 per breath. I cannot cough, I cannot shout. I have biceps, but I don't have triceps. So I can do this, but if my arm is like this, I cannot straighten it. So I've learned to use gravity for that. When I had my accident, my hands were totally flat. So only thing that I could do was clap or slap. So neither of them were very comfortable, so I used to crepe bandage my hands and made a hook out of it so that, you know, I learned to tie with my knuckles and can grab and hold a pen or a fork whenever required. So this was all done by you? That was, yes, basically, you know, uh, adapt to survive kind of an attitude. Right. And uh, that has helped me a lot uh, throughout the years. Okay, coming to your professional life, you chose to become a trainer. And you have done a lot of corporate trainings as well as youth trainings. How has that experience been? And uh, what was your objective? Uh, training, uh, I'm, number one, I'm not a full-fledged trainer as in I do not do 9 to 5 sessions. Mm -hmm. I uh, basically um, do one hour, one, one to two hour uh, segments. Mm -hmm. uh, not only because of my physical condition, I think uh, people do get bored because right. of my talk is called sedative. Yeah. So <laughs> people do get, tend to get bored of me. But uh, anyway, uh, 9 to 5, I do not do. So training, I just came across, I came across um, uh, somebody and he asked me, tell me about yourself. And I started my whole story. And uh, then, you know, uh, he said that, would you be able to, to share it in front of 20 people? I said, I won't mind. And then he said, 100 people. And then from that day onwards, my you know guide, my mentor, Kamran Rizvi, in that field, uh, he plugged me in. And uh, it became a money-making career, uh, okay. somehow or the other. Okay. <laughs> uh, talking about your life, what, according to you, are the three success factors that have made you who you are right now? Um, there's a thing that I always share in my talks is uh, that, you know, past, present and future. Mm -hmm. So basically, I don't have any regrets. Why did I die? Why did I, you know, make that decision? Had I not done my marathons and not been so reckless, I would have had a better medical condition maybe. Uh, there could be many reasons for many things that have happened in my life. Right. But uh, there's been many good things that have happened in my life also. So, um, I don't have any regrets. Uh, at the same time, uh, when you're living in the present, you know, I don't have any false sense of security. Mm -hmm. Because I have seen life very up close and been near death experiences, to brutal experiences, to insensitive experiences. Um, it can take a turn for good or bad at any moment for anybody. Kisi ki lottery nikal sakti hai and somebody can just break their neck like me in a second. So, um, uh, my, uh, you know, uh, key for survival is basically to live in the moment, live in the present, uh, enjoy as much as I have because uh, I don't know what future holds for me or future holds for anybody for that matter. And I cannot worry myself in that false sense of security that if I take things easy, things might become, you know, easier for me in future right. also. So I do what I feel like. I do it at times at the wrong moment and maybe was not able to exploit too many things. But at the same time, it comes from within. So when I do it, uh, you know, pushing in my condition, pushing a 42 kilometer uh, course is, yeah. is not uh, very convenient and at this point I can barely push from here to there yeah. so you know I can see the difference in my physical self also but it was all worth it and uh, I think as long as a human being has a constant sense of improvement uh, you keep going on as soon as you get stagnated on that uh, your life is over you don't have anything to live for so you know you might as well die yeah. So, um, that is something, you know, when I was, now that I'm physically inactive, writing is my substitute for this and right. uh, that's what I do. Sure, um, I was about to go to your writing aspect. Uh -huh. um, you are a writer. You have recently launched a book also. Yeah. Um, what are the specific fields or specific topics that you touch through your writing? 
uh, I don't know if you have read any of my <laughs> my writings, but uh, I the uh, one of the reasons that I am not with the publication is that one that I don't write so well, and secondly is that I am not very consistent at all. Okay. So you know, I write whatever I feel like and whenever I feel like. Mm-hmm. And uh, it could be politics, it could be human behavior, it could be social behavior, but primarily on human and social level. Okay. That is what I enjoy the most. But uh, obviously, to keep it relevant, I do touch upon you know different issues around also. Okay. Uh, so we're just going to take a short break. And yeah. Let's just take a short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. So, Sarmad, um, we were talking about your success factors. You have been an inspiration for almost everyone who has met you in life or who knows you personally. Who has been your inspiration? Um, again, tough question. I think many people in in bits and pieces. Obviously, my um, you know parents, especially my mother. Uh, but now that is in hindsight. But uh, you know, as far as I can remember, I wanted to enjoy life. And when I had my accident in my hospital room, I had a wall full of posters of uh, motorbikes, and starting from Harley Davidson to whatever not. Mm. And uh, I won't say they were my inspiration, but. I think the fact that I wanted to get out and enjoy life, that has always been my inspiration. And if to do that, I have read and, you know, uh, seen or uh, about many individuals, like, for example, Muhammad Ali Clay, Malcolm X, uh, and, you know, many other names that I don't recall right now. Mm-hmm. But in different phases of my life, they helped me, uh, you know, at least find a path uh, by, you know, guiding me, not virtually, but uh, guiding me in a way that, you know, how did they come across different uh, challenges that they faced and what was their stance on it. Yeah. And uh, I think my source of inspiration is primarily most of the hurdles that I face. Uh, they inspire me a lot. Uh, if, uh, if there's an office that has stairs and I'm invited, you know, that is my high on that. Uh, I like to get where I'm not expected to go. So uh, I think that is my my take on life and my inspiration in life. So as soon as I wake up with mentally active brain, oh, sorry, mental being ment- uh, wake up mentally active, I would uh, I would keep doing things. Uh, not sure what, but uh, will do one thing or the other. And uh, I think as for, you know, if you ask about my future plans or what I intend to do right. now, uh, it was, uh, and, you know, I think in many, at many levels, I'm a narcissist. So I do what gives me more, a lot of attention. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I've been an athlete. I've been a, a keynote speaker. I've, uh, you know, tasted that. Um, now I've written a book. So right. you never know. Maybe uh, make a song or so something, you something like that. I just want to try everything. I just want to life. try everything in life which gives me attention. Right. <laughs> so other than this, what are your hobbies and interests? Uh, it's primarily music. It's primarily music. Then I have a lovely, lovely partner, my dog. Uh, he's a great Dane called Babar. Okay. So Babar and I spend at least one and a half to two hours every day together. So we roam around the streets of Islamabad. So that is my one thing. And then music is basically, and then reading and writing. That comes on a later level. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, your future plans we've already discussed. Yeah. As you just mentioned. <laughs> Talking about your wife, um, how much of a support and, uh, you know, how much has she taken you forward and how much has she helped you throughout this entire process? Immensely, I would say. Uh, but I think any relationship is basically uh, all about complementing each other. And uh, 
I wouldn't say that uh, she did marathons on my behalf, but she was supportive of whatever decisions that I took. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the people were scared for many other reasons, Pakistan or my health consideration. But I never had that issue at home. And, uh, you know, your spouse is one of your, I, I would say rather your most critical um, stakeholder in life. So I do have to have that, uh, you know, comfort that whatever I'm do, I'm not, you know, harming in any way or not trying to, you know, imbalance my house or my relationship with Sarah. Yeah. So uh, in that regard, she's been a great support. She's been, she understands me, she knows me. Uh, she gets what I want to do and uh, how I can progress in it. Uh, she's a psychologist, so that helps in many ways also. Right. <laughs> that, you know, she can read me and tell me that, you know, this is what I want and this is what I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a very amazing uh, 11 years now. So, so looking forward to a lot more of it. Right. Yeah. Sarvat, in the end, your message for the nation of Pakistan. I don't feel that, you know, I'm worthy of giving any message as such. But um, I, I do feel that, you know, uh, as Pakistanis, we need to uh, come out of the fact that, you know, governments make nations. Uh, we somehow tend to believe that. And my personal humble opinion is that nations build nations. And then governments come and go. So I think that the realization of taking responsibility at an individual level. Uh, we have made it uh, maybe through this media and then the forms of media, yeah. uh, internet and TV. Uh, we like to, you know, be very aggressive because it catches attention. Yeah. And uh, again, you know, 15 minutes of fame is a very critical part of our society these days, yeah. which is uh, not a very healthy sign. Um, I, I, I'm all for fighting for your rights and, you know, protesting against whatever wrong is happening. I do not uh, in any way disregard that. But at a personal level, uh, how much do we know about ourselves? How much, you know, care we take about our own self? And, uh, you know, we basically have to realize that we are the ones who will build this nation, not, you know, the current government or the coming government. They'll facilitate the process. We all need to realize that we do have to take that responsibility. And not the fight way, about things. At some point, are ignoring or just letting go of it? No, we like to... Uh, if I'm on a wheelchair uh, and I don't want to do anything in life, I don't want to go to college and study, I don't want to uh, uh, what you work or make money, I just want to live off my parents' expense and sit at home and enjoy watching movies right. and TV. If I tell somebody, yeah, I'm a quadriplegic, shoulder down, paralyzed, they would understand, yeah, ke bacha bachara vaakei, you know, he's in a condition, he should be resting at right. home. Uh, but, um, uh, and I can blame it on my disability or lack of accessibility. So blaming, you know, gives me that comfort that, you know, ke maine uske kande pe dal diya, ke jab tak hakoomat ramps ni manayegi, mein bahir ni aunga. Right. So it is not my fault that I'm not getting out, it's the government's yeah, fault that I'm... So uh, we we need to let go of that. Uh, you know, we have to realize that uh, we need to do whatever we need to do. We cannot blame or anything uh, on anybody else. You know, whatever happens to you, uh, again, I cannot generalize it, but uh, in my experience, you can fight it out if you want to. And we have seen many examples in Pakistan do that. Mm -hmm. And not only me, I think. So my... A core thing would be that we sh must realize, get less angry, uh, must introspect, must look at things in a very pragmatic way and then decide to take action. We take action and, and then, then you know, we start to walk backwards right. and then realize that, no, this guy was not worth it. Right. <laughs> worth all the rallies or worth all the... Yeah. <laughs> so whatever, I'm not trying to be political, but uh, that is what I feel about Pakistan. Right. Thank you so much, Sarma. We wish Most you all the best. Time. For more Pakistani profiles, visit our website, pakistaniprofiles.com.